I want to turn the floor over to Tanner, who is joining us from Toronto. Uh, the floor is yours, Tanner. Thank you uh, so much, Michael, and uh, thanks to the Marxist Education Project for this excellent series. Um, I'm really delighted to be here to um, give a, a sort of a brief overview of the, the gist of the arguments I make in my recent SR21 essay, Socialists on Social Media Platforms Communicating Within and Against Digital Capitalism. Um, I had a lot of fun putting together the slide presentation for tonight's event. Um, and so um, there's a lot of images involved. And so I hope those will be uh, interesting to you. And I decided to focus more on the broad sweep of socialist media communications history um, to bring us from the late 19th century uh, up until the 21st, um, where I won't spend as much time going into elaborate detail about what I have to say about the 21st, but I'll nonetheless touch upon, upon a few key points, but put that within the sort of broader sweep of, of history uh, and the history of socialist communications, okay? So I'll get going with, uh, with Breck. So in the 1932 essay, The Radio is an Apparatus of Communication, Bertolt Brecht made a positive suggestion to transform radio into a dialogical medium for many-to-many -many communications. Quote, radio is one-sided when it should be two, said Brecht. And the radio would be the finest communication apparatus in public life if it knew how to receive as well as how to transmit, how to let the listener speak as well as how to hear and thereby bring many into a relationship with many others instead of isolating them. Brecht at the time saw the state as the only entity capable of remaking radio in this way, but because radio's quote proper application might make it a revolutionary medium, Brecht concluded that the bourgeois state would have no interest in sponsoring such exercises. In the 20th century, the institutions of radio were, for the most part, designed for one-to-many and one-way communications. It was largely used as a medium by both corporations and national governments to transmit messages to listeners separated by geographical distances. And so in the early 20th century, radio seemed to be at once a nation-building instrument, a way to unify uh, national subjects within a territory over which a state exerts sovereignty. And it was also used by corporations largely to entertain, sometimes inform in the case of public broadcasting, but most of the time to expose listeners to advertisements for latest products and services capital was selling in the marketplace. So on the whole, radio shows were made to inform, entertain, and sell, not to let every listener speak and hear. It could have been a two-way dialogical many-to-many -many medium, but for the most part, we as listeners were on the receiving end of a flow of messages communicated at us and to us by large organizations, whether they be private or public. Max Radler's painting, The Radio Listener, give some expression to this idea of the radio as a means of transmitting messages to listeners. Now, television um, largely followed a similar path to that as radio, at least in the United States. Owned by corporations for the most part, TV was designed to serve capitalism's demand creation exigencies um, by transmitting advertisements for the latest commodities to millions of people. And so the real content for folks like Dallas Smythe and other political economists of communication were the advertisements between the scheduled shows, not the shows themselves, which basically functioned as bait to attract an audience to, of course, be exposed to an ad flow for products and services. Um, television was also serviceable to the political communication strategies of parties, politicians, and their public relations handlers. Um, a kind of mediatized political theater exposed and investigated by Joe McGinnis in the classic 1969 book, The Selling of the President, which is about the utility of television to Richard Nixon's uh, campaign at the time. Um, and when tuned into TV shows, uh, of course, viewers could see but not be seen, nor could they share what they thought about what they saw with everyone else watching. So like radio, television was a one way, one to many communications medium for the most part. Nonetheless, Breck's positive suggestion for many to many communication systems seems to have come to fruition with the internet 
and more recently with the spread of social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So today, socialists around the world are using the internet and platforms to produce, distribute, exhibit, and consume socialist media and cultural works. And they're openly building events, movements, and organizations within digital capitalism to go beyond it. What do contemporary internet and social media platforms give to and take from socialist communicators, especially as compared to the 20th century's mass media industries, whose state and corporate owners or shapers tended to filter out and vilify most socialist ideas and expressions? So that's the question that I attempt to answer in my SR21 essay. So taking it as axiomatic that communications underpins any possibility for socialist politics, my essay historicizes socialist communications from the old media world of the 19th and early 20th centuries, all the way to the new digital media world of the early 21st. So, okay, I'll start with some history. Socialist activist organizations and parties have always engaged in multimedia communications, but their freedom to express themselves in bourgeois society has ebbed and flowed, as the major means for communicating on a massive scale have mostly been owned by the bourgeoisie, which has not been very supportive of the free expression of socialist ideas, especially when that class power was being challenged. So as a consequence of not owning substantive means of communication, and being subject to the ideas of those who do, socialists have mostly tried to spread their ideas and speak to one another and to the working class through media made by itself and its own largely small scale media operations. So returning to the work of Karl Marx, a great journalist and early socialist media communicator, the mid 19th century's most significant socialist media communicator, uh, of course, on commission to the Communist League, Marx in the first two months of 1848 with dip pen in hand, wrote the manifesto of the Communist Party. This was published anonymously by the London based German Workers Educational Association, which used its own printing press to mechanically reproduce and bind its ink pages into a thousand or so book copies. And then it administered the works translation from German into Polish, Danish, Swedish and French language editions. Now the League's newspaper, um, the Rhenish newspaper, which was edited by Marx, serialized the manifesto. But the first English language version of the manifesto was published in the late 1850s by the Red Republican, an English socialist newspaper. Now, exiled to London after the failure of the 1848 revolutions, Marx made his way between 1852 and 1863, of course, with modest pay from the New York Tribune, for his op-eds, which reached 200,000 readers. To most Americans of the day, Marx was known mostly as a rabble-rousing journalist, not a historical materialist philosopher. And so it's interesting just to think back to Marx's career as, as a journalist. After all, the first English language version of the manifesto only appeared in the United States in 1871 as a serial in Woodhill and Claflin's Weekly, which was a socialist feminist magazine of the age. Capital's full English volume appeared over 10 years later, five years after Marx's death in 1888. So in socialism's germinal period, socialists like Marx created content and organizations, mostly socialists, but sometimes bourgeois as well, as in the case of the New York Tribune, circulated that content far and wide. We can go to other contexts as well. For example, the Italian Socialist Party released the first issue of Avanti on December 25th, 1896, which was later edited or co-edited by Antonio Gramsci, who had previously written um, for, for other papers. Um, and across the Atlantic, the burgeoning Socialist Party of America, which in 1912 got nearly 900,000 votes for its presidential candidate, Eugene Debs, was running mass newspapers such as the Chicago Daily Socialist and the New York Call. Produced by a staff of over 60 people and circulated to half a million readers each week, Appeal to Reason was the biggest American socialist newspaper of that era. Uh, it ran headlines, as you see here, like capitalism rules the world. How do you like it? And papers like this did important things like serialized chapters from, from novels of the age, like Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, as a way to make proletarian literature more accessible to readers. 
In any case, in the late 19th and early 20th century USA, socialist media constituted a radical counter public sphere that existed on the margins of, but sometimes entered the liberal bourgeois public sphere of the day. In this era of socialist ferment in the United States, socialist media could be read, seen, and heard by tens to hundreds of thousands of people. And socialists communicated to inform and persuade, to engage and defeat the ideas of their opponents, and to organize the working class to their politics. That's sort of an interesting sort of period to study and, and a really excellent book on this period, you know, the heyday of sort of the radical press and socialist media in the United States is black, white, and red all over. If we jump over to another context, if we go uh, over to turn of century Russia, for example, the situation was markedly different and much more restrictive for socialist media communicators. 15 years before the revolution that propelled Vladimir Lenin's Bolsheviks to power, Lenin had proposed a model for revolutionary socialist media in the 1902 pamphlet, What is to be Done? So in the context of the Tsarist regime's repression of working class parties, the abolishment of strikes, the erasure of press freedom, and the fragmentation of socialists, Lenin conceived of a Russia-wide underground party newspaper, uh, Iskra as, quote, an enormous pair of smiths, bellows, that would fan every spark into a general conflagration. Lenin's newspaper would be made by party vanguard, circulated through clandestine networks uh, to like-minded readers, and then serve as a collective organizer of the cadre. The newspaper's role for Lenin was to propagandize the party line, expose the hypocrisy of the reigning state and capitalist class, and foment working class revolution. After the revolution and uh, following his return from exile, Lenin gave his famous 1919 What is Soviet Power speech to the Bolshevik Party Conference. And though this was recorded by gramophone and replayed by radio broadcast many years later, it was initially only listened to by those who attended the conference. So again, there was limited reach to that incredibly significant speech. Okay, so the Bolshevik state's media cultural apparatus that eventually developed throughout the 1920s and 30s, as well as those administered by its satellite states through the uh, Soviet Union, were as technologically sophisticated as they were, of course, uh, repressive. But back in the United States, the first Red Scare is basically what landed the first major blow to socialist freedom of expression and communications on a mass scale. Nonetheless, throughout the 1920s and 30s, socialist media resumed its relative freedom to be produced and consumed within the United States. And the newly formed communist parties launched all kinds of philosophical journals, newspapers, and related popular works. Uh, for example, the Communist Party USA supported the launch of the Daily Worker in 1924, which at its height achieved a circulation of about 35,000. The American cultural front uh, of the 1930s was made not just by the Communist Party, however, but by working class people themselves, who in an era of economic depression, New Deal compromises, militant labor unions, and rising fascist threats, got organized and created myriad socialist media and cultural works. So we see things like little magazines um, publishing working class stories, poems and cartoons. Here we see the Partisan Review and the New Masses as two examples of that. Uh, we saw the rise of proletarian novelist organizations such as the League of American Writers that issued political statements condemning um, historic fascism. Uh, where there were socialist authors, of course, writing books uh, at the time. Uh, for example, Mike Gold's Jews Without Money is a classic of that period. Uh, musicians uh, that were part of the cultural front making poignant political musical works such as Billie Holiday's Love Songs or Duke Ellington's Jump for Joy collections. Um, theatrical groups and uh, playwrights launched salient plays such as Clifford Odette's Waiting for Lefty, which I had the, the good fun of, of, of acting in as Sid back when I was a university student in the, in the late 90s. So in, in the first decades, or the first three decades of the 20th century, you know, it was really the high point of mass socialist parties and relatedly massive socialist media and cultural production and consumption. But for the next seven decades, um, at least in the West, at least in the liberal democratic capitalist countries of the West, successive generations of committed socialists would continually produce and circulate print and other forms of media, 
but their audience reach and their influence experienced a long decline. And, and this largely happened in conjunction, of course, with the Cold War, um, with the sort of prolonged anti-communism and Red Scare part two, and just the fact that we had a new kind of mass media and cultural industries emerging, uh, of course, first theorized by uh, Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer. So in the Cold War decades, the communist parties continued to run their media outlets, but as with those founded by Trotskyist political organizations and parties, they usually reached a much smaller audience than before. By the 1960s, the new left's challenge from the grassroots to higher education to both the US empire and Soviet propaganda regimes uh, could be epitomized by Michael Harrington's New America and Paul and Mary Jo Buell's Radical America, um, which again gave expression to the new movements of that era um, and, and also encouraged the growth of many vibrant scholar activist communities. And here you see some covers from Radical America of, of that time. Of course, some of these scholar activists launched um, significant magazines and journals such as the New Left Review and the Socialist Register in the UK. Um, and alongside the Socialist Journal Monthly Review established earlier in 1949, these three academic political crossover journals became especially vital in keeping the socialist tradition alive in hard times and, and of course still do. At the same time, the new left started experimenting with the new media of the age and the new media not so long ago that we now, of course, called old media was television. Um, and so the new left reconfigured tape recorders, cameras, video recorders and TV sets for nonprofit and a number of community activist media initiatives. Um, one of those being in 1971, Michael Schamberg's Guerrilla Television, which inspired countercultural TV projects such as TV TV, Broadside TV and University Community Vibe. Um, one of uh, my favorite experiences of that era was D.D. Halleck's Paper Tiger Television, which was launched in 1981. And this was a New York City based nonprofit public access TV show featuring great shows such as Herbert Schiller Reads the New York Times. And you see here a picture of Herbert Schiller, uh, one of the US's premier political economists of communication and eminent critic of American empire and communications, deconstructing the sort of bourgeois ideology of the New York Times, while also outlining quite a sophisticated Marxist theory of the media in society. At this time, you also saw things like the Situationist Internationales, Determant sort of practices, you know, um, railing against and trying to debunk the ideology of the Society of the Spectacle. And you had a whole bunch of sort of creative artistic activism of this era, devising tactics such as culture jamming, satirical parody, pranking, putting all kinds of creativity into the service of vibrant cultural resistance against the superstructures of capital. So this was again a very, very interesting moment, but, but again, um, they tended to exhibit, you know, as far as sort of socialist media production capacities and resources go, very small teams of producers, shoestring budgets, limited distribution, very small audience reach. And these types of initiatives simply could not achieve the influence on a mass scale that was once wielded by the earlier socialist parties and working class organizations. Um, and also they couldn't slow the growth of the mass media and cultural industries or the sway of, of course, the new neoliberal ideology um, that started becoming much more hegemonic in the 80s and from the 80s forward. Uh, just to give you a sense of this disparity, um, of this asymmetry of media influence, by the early 1980s, Radical America's readership was about 4,100. Monthly reviews was about 10,000. Um, but, you know, in 1980, that same year, um, there were 90 million people watching the CBS TV hit uh, Dallas, uh, particularly the Who Done It episode, the Who Shot JR episode. So, you know, this the scale doesn't even sort of come close when you're looking at these very scrappy sort of socialist media capacities and projects and what's actually happening in the mainstream mass cultural industries. Nonetheless, um, even the relatively modest diffusion of the internet by the late 1990s provided the bourgeoisie and some socialists with a new and powerful means of many-to-many -many mass transmissive and dialogical communications. Something that we're only beginning to grasp and that again I try to address more deeply in my SR essay. 
So the internet resulted from massive public investments, and you can go back to DARPA and ARPANET and millions of dollars of sort of federal government subvention that sort of underwrote and facilitated the research and development of the core infrastructure of what we understand to be the internet. And the commercial use of the internet was illegal basically up until 1992. But it was in the mid 1990s with the Clinton administration's dream of building a national then a global information superhighway um, that the internet basically was privatized and turned into something paved for by corporations and serviceable to online advertisers. And so you basically see the US state transferring the ownership and core operations of the internet to private hands and supporting the network's reconfiguration by new high tech companies into the motor of a US led globalizing digital capitalism. A 1994 New York Times story titled US begins privatizing internet operations aptly quoted tech entrepreneur Jordan Becker, quote, I see the commercial users of the internet to be the big winners here as the ent internet enters this brave new world. So throughout the 90s, the internet's potentially revolutionary message was massaged to grease the reproduction of market order. It was on the heels of this that software initially developed for public use by researchers at the University of Illinois was turned by Mark Andreessen, here featured by Time Magazine as a golden geek of the year, into Netscape, the first big for-profit web browser. And even bigger winners soon followed with the passage of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, the neoliberal legal centerpiece of the decade of massive internet speculation and massive media conglomeration and ownership concentration. This was in turn accompanied by new economy exuberance, the overvaluation of startups like Netscape and Yahoo, and the wave of mergers that led to AT&T, Comcast, and Verizon forming the internet service provider oligopoly, which, as you probably know, keeps jacking up internet connection and digital service prices. At the same time, uh, the internet was seen by the US foreign policy apparatus um, to be a vital significance to the expansion and maintenance of the US empire, both for economic, geopolitical, and cultural ideological ends. In a foreign policy essay entitled In Praise of Cultural Imperialism, David Rothkop captured the American empire's real politic of the information age. Quote, it was strategically crucial that the U.S. do whatever is in its power to shape the global Internet's infrastructure, the rules governing it, and the information traversing it. This involves setting technological standards, defining software standards, producing the most popular information and cultural products, and leading in the related development of the global trade and services, end quote. So capital throughout the 90s established much ownership and control over the Internet, um, and many websites throughout the 1990s. But it's important also to remember that the 1990s, the latter part of it at least, was also marked by the rise of a new cyber left and indie media organizations that attempted to reconfigure or at least use the internet as a salient means for socialists and activists to speak, get heard, and be seen. So the anti-globalization movement of movement protests, beginning with the Battle of Seattle in 1999, November, and the disruption of the IMF and World Bank meetings in Washington in April 2000, were cheered as the dawn of an altogether new form of mass politics. And these were very much prepared by the internet. At the same time, um, you see a lot of new forms of, of activism emerging with NGOs, unionists, students, anarchists on the front lines of these rhizomatic rebellions um, doing very creative anti-corporate culture jams, uh, such as the one that you see here. And using the web to do all kinds of things, everything from, as Naomi Klein pointed out, cataloging the latest transgressions of the World Bank to bombarding Shell Oil with faxes and emails, distributing ready to download anti sweatshop leaflets for protests at Nighttown. So these net centric protests often fueled the mass media spectacle of the left as violent, disruptive, freakish, or incoherent. The internet sometimes even sort of was criticized as fomenting or fostering some kind of slacktivism or clicktivism, that feel good activism which fosters the illusion of having a meaningful impact on the world without demanding anything more than joining an online group. Um, and so there are a lot of critiques of that being made, of course, at the time and in the early 2000s as well. 
By the turn of the millennium, with the dot-com bubble bursting and Y2K anxiety going wild, right and left cyber optimism started to lose some of its luster. Nonetheless, as 9-11 spawned the war on terror and the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, millions of people in every major city on the planet were using the internet to communicate about anti-war activism and also anti-war organizing. And they were climbing out of their computer chairs to join the largest ever global marches for peace uh, in history. The subsequent launch of new social media platforms such as Facebook in 2004, YouTube in 2005, and Twitter in 2006 um, happened amidst much hype about a shift from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0, and this reinfused new economy hubris with further revolutionary pretensions. Grifters of the Californian ideology now lauded these Web 2.0 social media corporations as revitalizers of popular sovereignty and participatory democracy. So Time Magazine named the 2006 person of the year, you. At this time, the little tech guys became the darlings of Wall Street financiers and Democratic Party politicos at the same time as they enchanted the masses with their promises of cyber empowerment. But soon after, of course, they became the world's most powerful corporations. And here we have the GAFAM or Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft, of course, as being the real uh, powerhouses, the real titans of the digital age. Nonetheless, by the time of the Arab Spring and the ad busters initiated Occupy protest of 2011, a new type of technological determinism was leading journalists to coin terms like Facebook revolution and Twitter revolution and YouTube revolution. Democratic Party innovation guru Alec Rose even touted the social internet as the Che Guevara of the 21st century. But of course, it's important to remember that smartphones did not make the new protest movements. Social media platforms did not build the, the uprisings. Human organizers did. In that regard, the digital technologies have not brought about a totally new means and a new meaning of being political. And the people using them, of course, did not unfortunately stop the global war on terror or nationalize Wall Street or bring it under democratic public control. But they did help activists to put the problems of empire and war, as well as neoliberal uh, social class antagonisms on the public mind. The failure of these network protests to bring about the massive social changes they demanded was a valuable object lesson in how and why the rabble of the streets needs also to rebuild organizations and even try to remake parties capable of intervening in and transforming the state. Fortunately, organization building has started to happen in the United States and elsewhere. And activists are doing this, of course, with smartphone and social media platforms open for battle. In the second decade of this 21st century, a new US-centered yet globalizing socialist media really started to take off. Thanks in part to the millennials that were early adopters of digital technologies and also those in Generation Z who came of age when social media platforms were already interwoven with their everyday lives. So what's new? Okay, so if you look at basically media and communications and the role sort of socialists played in trying to shape that environment, you know, from roughly World War II up until the sort of turn of the 21st century, widespread and incredibly fast moving socialist media was very, very hard to find. Nowadays though, socialist media content is widely available to almost anyone using the internet. And in my chapter, I offer many detailed ex examples of that. Um, but here are just a few. Okay, so on YouTube, um, we can basically tune into what's called BreadTube. And BreadTube is basically a word for the hundreds and hundreds of socialist channels and creators that are creating videos, streaming in, in, in real time, and being watched by hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of people, sometimes simultaneously. Um, a few examples of this. Um, um, is, you know, Vouch, who's renowned for winning live stream debates with far right and alt right propagandists. Uh, Vouch is basically subscribed to by 340,000 people. I mean, that reach is, is unlike anything uh, that, that earlier sort of print based socialist media publications could, could garner. Uh, another interesting YouTube channel is Tom Nicholas, a PhD student uh, who's subscribed to by about 150,000 
people. Um, this What the Theory series basically features Marxist humanities explainer videos, things like cultural materialism, Raymond Williams, cultures and structures of feeling, uh, a really, really sort of sharp uh, uh, video channel. Um, another is Angie Speaks, um, who creates really entertaining, yet super sharp, super sort of smart socialist videos um, based upon some existing works like Mark Fisher's Exit the Vampire Castle. Um, and the most recent video um, that's, that's gaining a lot of traction is Why I'd Rather Talk About Class, which is a really, really interesting engagement with the Joker movie. So that's just YouTube. I mean, there's like literally there's hundreds of socialist media uh, content creators, even political entertainers that, again, are garnering audiences in, in hundreds of thousands. Um, also on, on Facebook, of course, you have every socialist sort of imaginable, every socialist organization using that platform to publicize its events, to sort of build movements, to sort of spread uh, its, its uh, media content. Um, on uh, live game streaming platforms such as Discord and Twitch, socialists from all over the world are meeting in real time to debate and hash out socialist politics and to influence people on the right and on the liberal center. Um, on TikTok, um, socialists are posting funny political pitches to popular songs and trying to exercise some influence through that platform. Um, on Reddit, the uh, Our Socialism, um, there are thousands of threads about all kinds of socialist questions and answers, such as, am I too young to be a socialist? And what are the best books on the economic aspects of socialism? Um, on Instagram, um, you basically have a whole bunch of meme makers and meme creators, such as uh, socialism memes and sassy socialist memes that are creating, posting, and spreading all kinds of humorous and funny memes. Um, on Twitter, um, people, uh, of course, are connecting with one another across borders, forming sort of socialist sort of solidarity communities and tweeting their ideas far and wide. Um, and of course, there's hundreds of podcasts as well that have emerged over the past decade. Um, and one of those uh, featured here is Seasons of the, Season of the Bitch, a socialist feminist uh, podcast. So what exactly are socialists doing um, on these social media platforms? Well, on these social media platforms, socialists are challenging uh, the neoliberal common sense of much bourgeois media and its apologists for the status quo. They're also directly engaging and attacking the ideology of far-right propagandists with the goal of connecting with people where they're at, with the goal of winning them to socialism. On platforms, socialists are constructing positive socialist identities for themselves and conveying these to the world. Now, representing oneself as a socialist in a positive fashion, perhaps with a rose emoji on Twitter, for example, is a way to proudly express this identity and be recognized for it, which is an important political symbolic act given the long history of anti-socialist shame campaigns in the mainstream media and in the United States more generally. On platform, self-identified socialists are also searching for, forming, and participating in virtual socialist communities. These communities basically unbind socialist interaction from the constraints of geography or place, and they become new meeting spaces for socialists spread across cities, regions, and countries. So here we are right now on Zoom, uh, communing uh, about sort of the significance of socialist media on social media platforms. So um, on platform, socialists are also self-educating. So on YouTube, a learner can subscribe to free courses such as Reading Marx's Capital with David Harvey, engage with over a decades of, of recorded lectures featuring hundreds of educators on the Socialist Project's left stream channel, read Vivek Chibber's The ABCs of, of Capitalism pamphlet series alongside the video series. You know, flesh and blood educators will always matter. But for the many people that cannot access often urban-based socialist organizations um, or even necessarily enroll in college or university where they might meet a Marxist <laughs> socialist professor, these platforms are playing a very helpful role in making connections and making new socialists. So for the most of the 20th century, the socialist left was largely kept out of the mass media and cultural industries. But all of the above examples demonstrate how in the 21st century, socialists are logged on to massively populated social media platforms and commuting their ideas everywhere to anyone at any time. In digital capitalism, socialists are finding ways to produce, circulate, and consume abundant socialist media expressions in opposition to capitalism. So given the, the mass media industry's history of filtering out and demonizing socialists, these are all significant positive developments.
Nonetheless, there are limits to socialist communications on social media platforms too, and I'll just conclude with those. So socialist interactivity on much of the internet, especially socialist media platforms, perpetuates the profit and reproduces the market power of the big five, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. For the past decade, the big five's market capitalization, scale of operations, and user base have grown immensely, and they're valued today at more than $5 trillion. They basically influence almost the totality of the global internet's infrastructure, accumulation logics, laws, policies, and regulations, and even the ideological orientation of the digital media environment as a whole. So when we log into these social media platforms and we use them for our political communications, we in many ways get used by what Jody Dean long ago conceptualized as communicative capitalism or what Nick Chernichek recently calls platform capitalism. So to use these platforms, we must first consent to their owner's conditions. And when clicking accept, we become users subject to the corporation's terms of service, policies and community guidelines. Of course, that means we agree to let these companies collect data about everything we do and say well online. So socialists may be doing a form of unpaid digital labor and functioning as an exploitable prosumer commodity for these incredibly powerful companies. Also, you know, doing our politics through, the, through these platforms is risky because the relationship between platform owners and socialist users is not democratic um, by any stretch of the imagination. Platforms are accountable to their shareholders first, their advertisers second, and their users third. These companies could deplatform socialists and delete our pages and content whenever they like. And there's emerging, emerging instances of them doing just that uh, with very little explanation as to why. Uh, another issue is that platform capitalism or digital capitalism's data valence of us through these platforms is starting to converge and has been converging with um, state surveillance of citizens. And so while platforms have made socialists more visible to the mainstream and to more and more people far and wide, these platforms also potentially put every socialist that uses them in the security state surveillance crosshairs. So if the socialist left ever one day became a serious challenge to the status quo, the NSA officer would only need to turn to Facebook for a registry of the who's who of the 21st century socialist left. While the internet and social media platforms are enabling socialists to communicate in ways that were not possible in the pre-digital world of the mass media and cultural industries, there are major limits and risks to doing so. For now though, we should use these platforms and continue to build outside of and around them as well. In the end, social media platforms are supplements to, not substitutes for, the building of democratic socialist organizations and working class movements. And today, as always, that remains the key socialist challenge, on and off, with and through social media.